I want to welcome everyone to the weekly uh, meeting of the Rotary Club of Jonesboro. Uh, I have a little bit of announcement. So we are no longer the four-time club of the year, but we're the five-time club of the year. So, <laughs> so uh, learned that last Friday, So, which I was going to be disappointed if we weren't. So <laughs> we did all we could do. I said a lot of, lot of good folks really keeping this thing between the ditches for me. And inspirational moment. If you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And then we'll move on to the program. Uh, and Carrie, I believe, are you going to introduce Carrie White? So Mark and I have decided that we're going to do a little bit of a, a trade-off, and he's going to tell you all the important stuff, and then I'm going to tell you all the really fun stuff. So please welcome Mr. Mark Young. How's that? Is that better? Hey, it's great to see you. It's great to, to see you in person. It's great to see all the folks on Zoom. Hello. Um, it's great to be with you. As Carrie said, um, we thought we would sort of talk a little bit about a, a couple of different things. Um, for a few minutes, I want to talk about economic development, uh, some of the things that we see that are going on today, some of the things that we think will be happening here in the near future in 2021 and beyond. And then um, Carrie is actually gonna share some exciting news about a new program that the chamber is starting uh, that will begin this fall that we're super excited to share with you. And we know that some of your businesses will wanna participate in. Um, so when I started thinking about part of this conversation, you know, I, how many of you are Clint Eastwood movie fans? Anybody out there? I, okay. So I'm thinking about a title, you know, to, to what I might bring today. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly kind of came to mind, if you all are familiar with that, with that movie. Um, and looking back on 2020 in particular, you know, I think COVID um, and how it impacted our business community is kind of interesting um, because it devastated a lot of people and a lot of businesses. And at the same time, we had several businesses that, thrived um, because they were essential businesses and what they had to offer and the services they needed to offer uh, were in short supply and short demand and, and they couldn't hire enough people, right, to, to do that work. So I think as you look at just the virus itself and how it's impacted people, it's impacted businesses in a similar way. Early on in the pandemic, uh, Carrie and I and our staff contacted as many chamber members as we could and had lots of conversations with people. One of the things that really struck home to me is the line, the fine line between success and failure sometimes is pretty thin, right? Um, I had several conversations with companies who literally two to three weeks into uh, dealing with COVID were concerned about how they were going to make it. This was two to three weeks in. This wasn't, you know, a year in. Um, so the challenges are real. And for small businesses, that challenge continues to be real as well. He's great, isn't he? Um, that was Sam Holmstein for those of you at Zoom. Um, and, and so when we look at our economic development efforts, um, you know, if I would have predicted a year ago in April um, that the phone would have rang once, I, I would have been, you know, fibbing to you. I, uh, when COVID hit, when people were sent home, when, when things stopped, I expected a lot of our work to really change dramatically. In 2020, um, we had more inquiries than my 16 year history with the chamber. Who would have predicted that during a pandemic, we'd have more interest, more inquiries in our community than ever before. I wouldn't have predicted that. Um, so to say we stayed busy is an understatement. The other thing that's interesting is just like each of you and your businesses, we had to change how we did business um, as well. So I'm going to talk for just a minute about some of the good things that happened in 2020. Um, we saw Ritter Communications complete their data center and open it, and that provides a tremendous service to our community and the region and beyond for data services um, and support. Colson Manufacturing broke ground on a new 147,000 square foot building. They had a choice to make. They could have been anywhere else, and they chose to stay and invest in our community 
and continue a 70 year legacy that they have enjoyed in, in Jonesboro. So we're thrilled about that. Campbell uh, broke ground on a almost 300,000 square foot facility in the Craig Ed Technology Park. Again, they have locations worldwide. They had a choice to make and they chose to, to continue to stay here. Nice Pack not only had one expansion, they actually had two expansions in 2020. Over that course of time in the next year, they're, they're going to add 300 people total to their workforce and have investments totaling up to $65 million. And Nestle, right before Christmas, what a great Christmas gift, announced a $100 million investment and 100 new jobs in our community. So 2020, while just like each and every one of you, was a rocky road and it was challenging and difficult at times, there were good things that happened. And we're so thankful for these companies and many more that had success and worked hard. I was always amazed with our businesses at how each of you changed how you did business. Um, the numerous calls and conversations that Carrie and I had with business owners who literally said, we've changed our business model to stay in business, right? We're, we're doing things completely different. So um, not surprising to, to each of us, Jonesboro and Craighead County and Northeast Arkansas are filled with extremely bright, smart, hardworking business owners and business people that have continued to push forward. In 2020, we had added 842 not 842 new jobs in our targeted industries uh, and $87 million in investment. None of those count the ones I just listed a minute ago, which will be happening in 2021. So again, some good things that, that came from the year. We changed business too. So uh, how many of you love Zoom? All the people out on Zoom, raise your hand. And, you know, hey, Al Poston, Tom Trevathan. Um, so, you know, when you think about all the different platforms, and, and I'm going to mention just a few, few, Zoom, WebEx, Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, and many other platforms, is there was a platform to communicate with people, we used it. Um, I'm not necessarily going to say we loved it, but we used it, right? Because the business of economic development, business in general, is a relationship, right? So people want to do business with people they know and trust and a way to develop that knowledge and that trust is to communicate and to be with people. Um, one of the things that we started early on, Craig Rickert, if y'all know Craig, is our marketing person for Jones Pro Unlimited. He does an amazing job. He happens to be a drone pilot. Um, a couple of years ago, we worked with Craig to, to get the his pilot's license. Um, to say that that has come in handy would be an understatement. And so one of the things that we see moving forward is the use of that technology, if you will, and that capability to be able to demonstrate a picture's worth a thousand words. So for us to be able to show what a site looks like. And I'll give you an example. We had a, a company recently who asked about a piece of property that they were looking at and specifically how it handled water. You know, what was the drainage like? The day after a big rain, we put the drone in the sky, actually shot aerial photo of the, of the site and said, you know, here we had an inch and a half of water yesterday, you know, of rain. Here's what it did. It looks great. It's high and dry. It's a way to demonstrate and communicate what we're doing and, and the assets that we have at the Craig Ed Technology Park in a different way maybe than we would have in the past. The other thing that I'll mention is virtual site visits. We're so used to companies and consultants coming to Jones World to look at real estate, to look at property, to, to actually be here and be with us. And we still are getting some of that, but obviously in the middle of COVID, very little of that happened. So several consultants, several companies went to a virtual site visit. And I'll tell y'all the challenge for me anyway, uh, in, regard, in that regard. So during a regular site visit, it's not uncommon, number one, for us to sign non-disclosure agreements. We, we can't talk about the companies that we're working with, dealing with, et cetera, right? And also, it's not uncommon for individuals to give us fictitious names. You know, uh, they'll show up and they'll give us a first name. They're Bob and she's Sally, and we know that's not their real names, but nonetheless, that's how we're going to communicate during their time here. And it's a way to protect the confidentiality of the project. Well, when we switch to virtual site visits, again, if you've used Zoom, 
And, you know, I'm looking at the screen here today and, and the screens that there's no name and no picture at. If you could imagine, this has happened multiple times, a four hour meeting where they can see us, they can see me and, and my colleagues. We can't see them at all. No name. It just says client one, client two, client. And I'm not making this up. Twenty five. We had twenty five people on a call once. Um, no visual. So as the questions were being asked to one consultant, they would pose the question. And of course, we would start to answer. And if I did this today, you know, I'm looking forward to somebody going, you know, am I answering the question? You get the nonverbal feedback for four hours, zero nonverbal feedback. It is torture if you've never had to do that. But I think it's a way of the future. I think we're going to see more and more of that, uh, that use of technology, the use of being able to communicate worldwide um, so that that individual, that consultant, that company doesn't have to be on a plane, doesn't have to be here. But I will tell you this, if you're going to invest, whether it's $100,000 or $100 million, you want to see the place, right? And so um, we're that, that participation, the people who are now traveling to Jonesboro to see firsthand our community has started a steady increase. Um, so 2021 and beyond, I will mention to you guys, um, and he's a fellow Rotarian at the Morning Club, but 2021 started off in a pretty difficult situation for us. Uh, Mike Philpo, who's Vice President of Economic Development for Jonesboro Unlimited, uh, passed away suddenly. And I've never had to deal with the death of a colleague uh, before. And, and I don't think anybody at our office had had to deal with that. Um, the great thing about Mike was not only was he a really good economic developer, he was a better person. And so the challenge for us was not just getting beyond, you know, um, what we came to rely on him professionally, but personally, he was just such a great person to be around, so kind, so joyous, I think is a word that Carrie used before. Um, you couldn't help but, but love Mike. And so uh, just early in January, Mike passed away, and, and that was a, a big challenge to us. Um, I am happy to say, though, that uh, recently we uh, employed Stephen Lamb. Stephen is the Vice President for Economic Development for Jones World Unlimited. Stephen moved here from Fort Smith is doing a tremendous job. And I'm also pleased to tell you he's a great economic developer because he's already changing our population. Uh, he and his wife uh, celebrated the birth of their second child three days ago, four days ago now. So um, we're excited for them and excited for them to be part of our community. Stephen is, is doing a great job. He's gonna be a great asset to our community. I encourage you when given the opportunity um, to visit with him and get to know him a little bit better. Um, lastly, before I call Carrie up, I do want to, well, actually two more things. One is you may have, re may have read that we also have been dealing with an issue with the federal government wanting to change the status of metropolitan statistical areas. Um, there's a long story I won't tell you uh, that we don't have time for in terms of how I found out about that. It was not widely known. How many of y'all read the Federal Register? Okay, that everybody in the room, uh, we're all together. None of us read the Federal Register. That's where it was actually first mentioned that the Metropolitan Statistical Area designation would change, and it would impact 144 of the 385 metropolitan areas in the United States. And the Office of Management Budget, I believe, had no intention of spreading the word uh, that this change was looming. So um, we reached out to friends and colleagues uh, around surrounding states that are in similar sized communities that were gonna be impacted by this too, and uh, sort of started a grassroots effort to combat this change. I also wanna say that our federal delegation has been tremendously helpful. Um, all of them have been great to work with. Senator Bozeman uh, co-authored uh, a letter, a bipartisan letter to ask OMB to not move forward with this as well. Um, the jury's still out. We don't know what's going to happen yet, but uh, we'll keep you guys posted. It's extremely important to our community. It's extremely important to the county. County judges here today, I want to thank him for all of his work. He and the mayor both um, 
really went to work to, to help us make sure that our voices were heard um, and that at the national level that they understood the challenge that it would present and how important this is. The crazy thing about it is the OMB, when I asked, I have a contact there, when I asked that person if they looked at how this would impact communities from an economic standpoint, the answer was no. We're only interested in statistics. And I said, well, in my community, there's going to be a statistic that I'm going to have a problem with. And that is when our budgets are depleted at the city and county level, because we no longer can participate in programs that we qualified for previously because we're a metropolitan statistical area, that's going to be an issue. At last count, there are 36 different funding agencies that use MSA as a way to designate whether you qualify or don't qualify for certain funding and programs. That's a problem for lots of us. So we continue to fight the fight and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, and I hope that uh, in the near future, we'll have good news on that. Lastly, uh, Jonesboro Unlimited is finishing our uh, five-year strategic plan. And so we're in the process of our plan for the future. So uh, many of you know that Momentum Jonesboro, um, we had a goal of helping companies create 2,500 new jobs. Uh, we surpassed that in year three to date. Almost 4,000 new jobs have been created over four years. Um, and we're excited about that. We're excited about what the future holds. We engaged the expertise of Ernst Young to help us with our um, strategic planning. And they have been part of our community for the last, oh, five months and helping us put this plan together. And next month, we'll roll the plan out. I'm excited about it. I have a draft copy in my inbox right now that I've read twice. Um, there's some great initiatives in it that will really move our community forward. It will focus on four key areas. One is business attraction and expansion, continuing to help our existing business and industry grow and expand and recruiting business and industry that will complement what we already have here. Secondly, is talent attraction. Uh, many of you have read and know of labor shortage across the United States, and we can get into that later if you want to. But uh, so part of our strategy is how do we continue to grow our workforce locally? How do we continue to grow it here at home, but at the same time attract talent to the community? We have a strategy built around that. Infrastructure and quality of life are the next piece. Uh, each and every one of us want to see the quality of life in our community continue to get more and more improvement as we move forward. And so there are plans for that, along with needed infrastructure in our community. And lastly, uh, branding and marketing, telling our story. We have a great story to tell. And often I get the pleasure of sharing the news about Jonesboro and talking to people about what a great place it is to do business um, worldwide. In fact, literally right before I came here, we were finishing up a video that will be sent to a group of businesses in Korea next month that we're doing as a joint uh, activity with Arkansas Economic Development Commission to talk about the pro proliferation of the food industries in our community and in the state of Arkansas. So again, you never know when you're going to get that opportunity to tell your story and to who that story might be shared with. And we're excited to continue to do that. And so an important part of our strategic plan will be looking at how we can do a better job and be as effective as possible at sharing the great news about Jonesboro and telling our story both here and abroad. So with that, I'm gonna answer any questions. I'm gonna take like two questions and I'm gonna get carried up here, any questions. And I told Marvin if there were any hard questions, he, was got, he started raising his hand, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask him, any questions? Yes, great question. Um, County Judge, yep, County Judge Day asked if any of our businesses were having issues with the uh, Mississippi River Bridge being closed down. The answer is yes. Um, although that is, when I say starting to work its way out, um, I think people have done a great job of anticipating when those problems, those bottlenecks are going to occur. And so traffic is now being spread out over all day as opposed to from eight to nine or 7.30 to you know whenever. Um, but we did initially have issues with that. Several of our trucking companies expressed concerns as they were, especially early on the first couple of days, stuck in traffic for a period of time. Their drivers can only drive a certain period of time during the day. And so they had to stop short of their destination. 
uh, to, to comply with rules and regulations. And so that has been a challenge, getting some raw product and finished goods inside and, and back out of the community was a, a slight challenge for just a little bit of time, but um, that has, seems to be much smoother today than it was a, a week or so ago. So great question. What are some of the things on the horizon that you're looking at to retain the young millennials? I've got a 24 uh, year old son that fortunately moved back to Jonesboro. However, and he, and he works for Colson. So you believe bet. me, we're glad that Colson is staying here. Me too. Uh, he's looking forward to being a part of their new facility in a year. But sometimes he says, now I'm not sure I want to stay in Jonesboro. You know, you got Bentonville and you've got Little Rock where he came from. Uh, so what are things on the horizon to keep that age group here? Great, great question. A um, couple of things that I'll mention, and we've got a couple of people in the room that can address this better than I. Um, but one thing that we started several years ago that has done a great job, um, and today they're doing a phenomenal job, is the Young Professional Network. So it's connecting all of those young professionals together, right, and giving them a common goal, common ideas. Uh, he needs to be part of that group. <laughs> um, and But it's a way for, for them to connect and to have a voice and to help us as a Chamber of Commerce do things and help the community do things that maybe I wouldn't think about or that our community might not think about readily. Um, so that's one thing that can be done. Secondly, you know, I mentioned the quality of life piece in our strategic plan. And while I can't share all of that with you today, our board's not even seen the, the strategic plan, but um, there's some great things in there for us to work on over the next five years to enhance the quality of life and the amenities that we have in our community. Um, and so to your point, we want to make sure that there are things that people want to see and do in our community um, for all ages. And, um, and that's part of it. But again, I think continuing to create that network and growing that network of young professionals is an important piece of that as well. So uh, I look forward to mid-June when we unveil our strategic plan to be able to share more of that with you, but great question. Other questions or comments? Great. So it's my pleasure, Sam's laughing over here because I said, great, there's no other questions. Um, so I, as Carrie makes her way forward, um, if you look at the mission of the Jonesboro Regional Chamber of Commerce, it specifically talks about leadership development and the importance of leadership development. Carrie has been responsible for our leadership programs for years, I'm not gonna say how many, um, including our junior leadership program, our traditional leadership program. And as we looked around at maybe if there was a gap in what we were offering to our business community, um, we found one and we, we found a program that we liked a lot. And Carrie has really taken this program and done a great job and really has really want, run with this concept. So we're excited to share this with you today. I hope you'll uh, appreciate. And if you identify people within your organizations that can participate, we'd love for you to do that. So Carrie's going to describe a brand new program of the Jonesville Regional Chamber of Commerce. Carrie White. Thank you. Well, we are so excited about this new program. Uh, I know so many of you in the room have participated in our Leadership Jonesboro program. And Mark actually heard about this program that we're, we are adapting to uh, meet the needs of our community. And uh, it's called Emerging Leaders. It is going to be a program that is going to uh, specifically and very deliberately match young people who are on the track to move up in their careers or and their company with mentors who can give them solid and very practical real life experiences to help them hone their skills, their management skills. Um, as you know, in Leadership Jonesboro, we, we concentrate on community activity, service in the community, uh, learning about how you can contribute in the community and get involved in the community. This is gonna be more a one-on-one -on -one experience with the mentee and the mentor. Uh, we call it Emerging Leaders, uh, Engage, Enrich, and Empower. 
and um, we have got a, a short application form. It also requires a letter of recommendation from the uh, applicant's supervisor. And I'll just share with you the objective of the, of the program is um, we believe that our community community's core, the ultimate catalyst for growth is the ability to identify, engage, and empower the right people for leadership. We must take an aggressive approach to developing the human capital required to move our region forward. As a part of our mission to provide great leadership training, we bring you emerging leaders, an in-depth mentorship experience that pairs proven leaders with emerging leaders. The experience will equip emerging leaders with the opportunity to interact and with legacy leaders to learn the intangible skills that transformational leaders display. So um, we're very, very excited about what this will do for our community. It falls directly within our mission at the Chamber of Service, Leadership and Economic Development because it will address uh, keeping our talent here and um, uh, hopefully by providing this, we will be able to identify those emerging leaders that will be the leaders of the future. I won't, um, I won't comment on the age of a lot of us who are leaders in the community now, but we need to start mentoring some young people to take over for us. And um, so that's what we are going to attempt to do with this program. I want to just tell you briefly that it's, it's not like Leadership Jonesboro in that it's a eight month program. This is a lot shorter term. It's a lot more intense and um, it, it goes a lot faster. And a lot of the, of the interaction between the mentors and the mentees will be on a one-on-one -on -one basis as it should be on their schedule and as they are able to meet with each other. So there are five sessions and then uh, the mentee and the mentor are required to meet at least four times. In the process of this three or four months, what will happen is, is that the mentees will attend uh, vital sessions and after each of these sessions, they'll be able to discuss that with their mentor and maybe the issues that were addressed, uh, the problem solving that was addressed. So they're going to uh, do the strengths quest uh, uh, assessment. Um, it's different from DISC, like a lot of you have taken. It's different from Myers-Briggs, but it's called the strengths quest. Uh, there will be a session on emotional intelligence, inclusive workplaces, executive presence and influence, and change leadership. So that gives you an idea of the depth of the subjects that these 20 young emerging leaders will be uh, dealing with. I want to thank Michael Givens and the rest of our um, advisory council uh, for helping us get this together. Uh, it, it, we started it pre-COVID and um, obviously didn't want to do it until we could do it in person. Uh, we have a great team, um, Melissa Hardcastle at uh, Chicken Salad Chick. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, Brooke, uh, uh, my best friend in the whole world. Yeah, at Nab Holes. And uh, I'm trying to think without, I'm trying to tell y'all without. Anyway, we have a great group that has helped us put this together. We're very excited about it. I'm afraid I'm running out of time. June 10th is the deadline for applying for the program. I have a few applications with me. If you know of someone that you would like to pass this along to, that would be a great candidate. Uh, Michael Givens is our chair. And um, we did decide that we would, start with 20 this year, uh, keep it small, see how it goes, uh, get lots of feedback from our first crew that'll be going through. So please think about that if you have any questions or if you know someone that I should send an application to, please let me know. And because we are only taking 20 this year, um, we will 
need them to get those in promptly and and definitely before June the 10th. So I appreciate that. And if there's any time for questions, you can ask Mark. Because he, he didn't get to answer, I'm sure, all of y'all's questions. It's great to be back at my home club today. So this will I'll have to start coming back every week because it's been great to see everybody. So thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mark and, and Carrie, for, for coming and sharing with us today. It is interesting to hear that you had more inquiries in 2020 than you ever had. Hopefully uh, some of those Zoom meetings will turn into, like I said, the in-person visits because you got to think they're pretty serious if they're going to go that extra step. So thought for the day is, is everyone, if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. Henry Ford. I appreciate y'all and have a good rest of the week. We'll adjourn. <laughs>